this on? Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank, thank you for everyone that has come out to hear your word, Lord. Just bless them in a special way. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here in a mighty way today. Be with me as I bring this message and calm my spirit. You know how nervous I get. Give me the words that you would have me to speak. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. I've never been very wordy, and that's why it's kind of hard for me to get up here and speak. My mom told me one time I was 18 months old before I said a word. And when I did start talking, I was talking in full sentences. That's probably because my sister was there, <laughs> my older sister, and she did all the talking for me. Oop. Oh, there's something else. There's some papers on the floor. Knowing that I was going to might have to preach today, I started a preparation for this message on Monday. And I, it seems like every time I go to preach, I just bounce from one message to another because there's so much out there God has done for us. And I wasn't having much success uh, coming up with a message. So I thought, well, while I'm trying to make up my mind, I'll study my Sunday school lesson for this week, uh, Bob's class. And the, the name of that lesson is Evidence of a Changed Life. For every, every person that has accepted Christ into his life, their life has changed. It, it's just part of the deal. I thought, well, hmm, I'll tell my uh, salvation story my uh, testimony. 1963, we were attending a church, my mom and dad and my sister and I, the old Nazarene church on 4th and Church in, in Sandpoint, and it was a revival meeting. They had a, a preacher there preaching. He preached a salvation message. He wasn't a hellfire and damnation preacher. He just calmly gave us the facts about salvation and the need of Christ to forgive our sins. So my sister and I both, when he gave an altar call, went down and we were saved. Well, my idea of salvation at that time is probably a whole lot different than it should have been. It was pretty mistaken. Well, in 1966, uh, we moved to Kellogg. My dad had taken a job in, in Pinehurst in a barber shop. Well, the change was <laughs> was bad for me. All the kids that I grew up with and all the, the kids I went to school with or had to leave them behind. And starting a new school uh, is tough, especially in Kellogg, because Kellogg is a rough town. Anyway, with that, I uh, pretty much entered my prodigal period at that time. The word prodigal, what do you think of when you think of prodigal? It literally means wasteful. That's the definition of it. And that was a pretty wasteful period. And it lasted, with me, it lasted 10 years. Till 1976, my, my father died. And my father was was most important part of my life, basically. So when when he died, I was I was, fell into a really deep de depression, and uh, things were going pretty bad until one night I watched a, a Billy Graham crusade. I'd always enjoyed watching Billy Graham, but he had a young woman on there, Johnny Erickson, who Johnny Erickson taught her, and she gave her testimony how she had dived off in the water and broke her neck, and she was paralyzed from the shoulders down. But she had such a, a pleasant look on her face, and so peaceful, 
I thought, if, if God <coughs> can do that for her, he can do that for me. And I started uh, going to church. My sister was already going to church in Kellogg, where she lived. So I'd, I'd drive down on Sunday, and or Saturday night, actually, go to church two times on Sunday, and then come home back to work. Well, it was a Nazarene church, and the pastor there preached holiness. Ever, ever chance he got. So that's where I was introduced to holiness and was sanctified as a result. And it changed my life drastically. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been to that chain. That's, that's evidence enough. In 1972, my uh, father's two sisters came up from, from uh, Oregon to visit for a family reunion. And the first thing they did, they came up to me and my cousin standing there and said, we heard about you two. So that gives you kind of an idea of what, what my life was like. The other person, the other cousin was the guy that stuck his finger in the light socket, by the way. <laughs> so. In the Sunday school lesson uh, overview, the author states, this week's lesson explores the actions we take to keep this inner life vibrant and result in our distinctively different way of life. That salvation has uh, two parts. It's the human side and the divine side. The human element in that changed life can be summed up in one word, obedience. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The divine side can be summed up in the Greek word exousion. In John it says, as many as received him, he gave them power to become children of God. Well, that word power is actually exousion. And it literally means supernatural power. This power from with, out of existence, ex usion. I wrote down here, when I was thinking about that, this thought came to mind. History is the encyclopedia of changed lives, and scripture reveals the agent of that change, God, Holy Spirit. Change, the word change is a passive verb. It means something acts upon that verb. It's, it's not active. I did something, something was done to me. It's passive, so it's changed. So there has to be an agent that causes that change, and that agent is the Holy Spirit. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 9. This is a Damascus Road story of of Paul. And I've got it here somewhere. Can you, can you hear me all right? Last week, Vicki said I, I wasn't coming across too loud, so. Okay. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man, woman, or man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, did not, did not eat or drink, but he went. He was obedient to the Lord. Then he goes in and meets Ananias. And then Ananias went to the house and entered in. 
placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized after taking some so he regained his strength. Saul, in verse 20, Saul spent days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Who is this man? That's pretty dramatic change, isn't it? Saul, Saul was actually going around uh, murdering people. Throwing them in prison meant that they're probably going to die as a result. And Saul was mistaken at thinking that he was doing God's will. He was a Pharisee. He was a doctor of the law. And he just knew in his own mind that he was doing God's will. But he was mistaken. And, and God intervened in Jesus and, and made him see the light, literally see the light. And through the Holy Spirit, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we can be mistaken about stuff. We mean to do things that we think are good for us, but nine out of ten times they don't. In March of 2000, my son-in-law and another man and I flew to the North Slope in Alaska to work in the oil field up there. And uh, we were guaranteed six weeks work up there uh, basically just as a trial period to see if we were going to work out. Well, my son-in-law and I both have had a lot of construction experience. I worked in welding shops for 20 years before that, and my son-in-law worked uh, in, a, in a fab shop in, in Moscow building rock crushers, so we had a lot of experience building. Well, once the bosses found that out, they d decided they were going to send Dave home early so they could split up the, the shift and there would be one of us there all the time uh, as a crew chief. Well, Dave went home two weeks early and I was getting pr ready to come out, but a new man came and was working with us. He was working on my shift. We called him Psycho. His name was Jim Kirkpatrick. He, <laughs> he said, this place is driving me nuts. So that was his nickname. But everybody had been talking about Dave. And I told him, when Dave comes in, uh, you'll be on his crew. Okay. So I'm getting ready to leave, and Dave shows up. He walks in, and this Jim looks at me and says, is your wife tall? And I said, no, why? He said, look at him. Dave's six foot five. That's Sarah's husband. I said, he's my son-in-law, not my son. <laughs> but he was mistaken. Paul's mistake was a whole lot worse than that. They also had a greater change, too. So. Matthew seven twenty says, You will know them by their fruits. What Jesus was saying was there will be evidence to show a change has taken place in the lives of those who have been redeemed and have accepted Jesus as both Savior and Lord. There was a definite change in, in Paul, wasn't there? There are others throughout history that have had a dramatic change in their life. You know, written here, the life of another historical figure reveals how when we have a personal relationship with Jesus our lives are changed, and then and only then can we bear fruit. In uh, the year 1700, the emperor of Sweden attacked his neighboring uh, nations around him, nations that were uh, uh, governed by three different monarchs. That same year, uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf was born. 
1700. A story is told about him that that uh, when he was three years old or six years old, he would write love letters to 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 Jesus, and he would climb up to the top of the castle and throw these love letters out the, the, the window of the castle. Some, I suppose something like uh, little kids will write letters to Santa Claus, but. Uh, in 1719, when, when Zinzendorf was uh, 19 years old, he visited an art museum and he saw the painting, the name of the painting was H. A. Homo, which is Latin for Behold the Man. It's a, a picture, it was a portrait of the crucified Christ. And while viewing, staring intently at this, a voice told him, the voice of the Holy Spirit said, What have you done? <coughs> Excuse me. What have you done for me? And he replies, I have loved him for a long time, but I have never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. Total obedience. And what was the evidence of Zinzendorf's changed life? Well, in 1722, he allowed a bunch of uh, persecuted Moravians and Bohemians to settle on his property, on the corner of his property, and they built a village called Herrenhut, which means God's watchtower. And from there, uh, he sent missionaries out all over the world. But it says, uh, because there were so many different uh, denominations that were settling there, uh, quite a bit of controversy arose, and then there was a, a anger. So Zinzendorf, Zinzendorf began to go to every home and pray with the, the people in, in that uh, in the homes, and through that intense prayer and, and Bible study, the, those villagers were convicted that they that the disunity and conflict they had experienced was contrary to the clear calling of Scripture. So the community formed a document known as the Bruderlicher Vertrag, which means the brotherly agreement in uh, 1727. And later that year, at a, uh, a meeting, they were having communion, actually, the Holy Spirit came upon them and started a revival. They call it the Moravian Pentecost, and that revival lasted 100 years, supposedly. But more than likely, it was a whole lot more than that, because Zinzendorf was responsible for sending missionaries. I got a list of it. 1732, the community of Parenthood began sending out missionaries among slaves in the Danish governed West Indies and the Inuit of Greenland. Zinzendorf's personal and familial relation to the court of Denmark and to King Christian VI facilitated such endeavors. He saw with delight the spread of this Protestant family order in Germany, Denmark, Russia, and England. And one of the missionaries that Zinzendorf sent out went to Georgia in 1735. And that was the missionary that, uh, Moravian missionary that John Wesley uh, met there. And, uh, and through many meetings with um, August Spangenberg was the missionary's name. And by, by several meetings with him, Wesley was convinced of uh, the need of a changed life. So when he returned to England in, eight, in 1738, he went to a meeting on Aldersgate, and that's basically the birthplace of the holiness movement. And if you've been in a in a Methodist church very long, you know about that. 
but not only was Wesley uh, influenced, the mother of Francis Asbury. We talked about Asbury University last week. Well, Francis Asbury is the namesake for that university. But his mother uh, was Asbury, what Asbury called a, a very much a woman of the world. But in 1748, her daughter died. Uh, Francis Asbury was three years old at the time. And she was fell into a, a deep, dark depression until she met uh, traveling ministers that came around and were having revival meetings, and she was filled with the Spirit and, <laughs> and began to hold Methodist meetings in her every Sunday in her home. And she so influenced her son that he also went to into the ministry. He was 22 years old when John Wesley himself ordained him as an itinerant preacher, which is a circuit riding preacher. And in 1771, uh, just three or four years later, he sent him to the United States. And he became the first bishop consecrated in the Methodist Church in, in the United States. Rode 6,000 miles a year horseback on a circuit. 6,000 miles. That's 500 miles a month. I don't drive 500 miles a month even coming up here, and we're close to it, in a car. So he's pretty dedicated. And the Methodist holiness movement actually was started by Francis Asbury. Another person that Zinzendorf influenced was Diedrich Bonhoeffer. You've heard of the German theologian that was uh, murdered by Hitler. Bonhoeffer was born in 1906, but his mother and his two governess, governesses, uh, the Van Horn sisters, all three of them had attended Herrenhut, schooling at Herrenhut in Saxony. So he was influenced from a, a young, young time in the holiness movement because that's pretty much what they, they preached. Well, when he was 14 years old, he told his parents he wanted to be a theologian. So which is kind of strange in his family because his father was the leading psychiatrist and neurologist in Germany and probably all of Europe. His brother, older brother, Carl Friedrich, was a nuclear physicist that worked hand in hand with Einstein and Max Planck to develop the bomb. So although the parents thought it was all right for him to be a, a theologian. All his sisters and brothers thought he was nuts. So the story's told that, uh, that in 1921, Bramwell Booth, general that started the Salvation Army, came to Germany where Bonhoeffer was living and held a, a revival meeting. And Bonhoeffer, for the first time, heard evan uh, evangelistic methods. Then, then uh, Booth came back two, two years later and uh, Bonhoeffer wanted to join in and became very connected with that. And it said that he was so influenced by the, the joy that he saw on, <coughs> that he saw on uh, Booth's face he knew there was something there. So 1933, Bonhoeffer came to the United States. Bonhoeffer had his doctoral degree by this time with, and was a very well-known theologian in Germany, one of the top theologians. But he came to the United States, to New York, to Union Theological Seminary. And when he got there, you know, expecting graduate studies there, and he, when he got there, he said, there's no theology here. 
they were all wrapped up in the humanistic movement of the time that eventually led to the, that movement led to the God is dead theory. That's how dead they were. But uh, he was so disgusted with, uh, with uh, what was being taught there, he started searching for other churches that did know the Lord. So, and a fellow student of his, a, a black man, uh, Frank Phillips, invited him to go to a church with him, the Abyssinian Baptist Church in uh, in Harlem. And uh, there he saw the workings of the Holy Spirit and was himself convicted and he returned to to Germany in 1933 right at the beginning of the Nazi era and and he was one of the founding fathers of the confessing church that was uh, opposed to Hitler Hitler had t taken over the complete <coughs> control of of the uh, the German state church, the evangelical Lutheran church, but he'd taken over complete control of it, and uh, wouldn't uh, it had so many laws that were anti-Semitic that Bonhoeffer openly uh, opposed him. And Hitler would have got rid of him sooner if he could have, but he was so well known in Germany and so well respected by uh, any of the Christians there that he couldn't until 1945, two weeks before Hitler killed himself. They uh, had Bonhoeffer hung, but he left behind uh, changed lives everywhere. He actually. Uh, started secret seminaries to train young men in several different places in Germany, right under the nose of the Nazi party. He joined uh, a part of the Nazi party just to become a spy, and he was a spy that continually worked against Hitler. And he was part of the, the uh, Valkyrie conspiracy the conspiracy to, to kill Hitler. Stauffenberg, the man that carried the bomb that they tried to blow up Hitler with, was a cousin of Bonhoeffer. So, but he left behind a legacy that changed, changed many lives. He was offered a uh, safety in the United States in 33. They knew that the, the Nazi party was out to get him, so they sent him to America. He stayed for 26 days and said that he couldn't, couldn't stand not being part of the opposition and wouldn't, wouldn't stay away. He had to be back with his, his brother preachers in Germany. Helmut Traub is a former student uh, speaking about his return, after his return. It was said that he was practically destined to rebuild the Protestant church after the debacle which was in store for us. That's uh, a student's words. That debacle was the Nazi party that took over. He was killed, but his legacy lives on. If he had lived, he probably would have been the one to just totally restore the German church. I read a book by uh, Chuck Colson many years ago. Colson went to Germany for a, revi uh, a revival meeting. And he has asked one of the German pastors there, probably one of Bonhoeffer's students, uh, how many true born-again Christians are there in Germany? And he said, mm, probably about 2,000. Of a, huh, several million. But those 2,000 probably were influenced in some way by Bonhoeffer. He was executed 
at Flossburg Concentration Camp. And it says here, after witnessing Bonhoeffer's death, the Flossenburg doctor reported, in almost 50 years that I have worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely <coughs> submissive to the will of God. That's a testimony. There. That's a testimony. How many lives have been changed by our lives, our, our witness? I already gave my testimony. Would anybody else like to give their testimony? This is a good time to do that. We used to have testimony meetings all the time in the Nazarene Church, but I haven't heard one in years. But this is your chance to testify if you would like. How has God changed your life? How has God changed your life? Anybody? Hmm? If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I was at today. Well, yeah, me too. I'll tell you, God protected me in my prodigal period time and time again. I mean, literally protected me from being killed many times. So, have your, Has your life been a witness to others? Listen to Dr. Uh, um, folks, Jim Dobson, James Dobson. He said that he was always a little uh, jealous of people that had a, a testimony of where they had come from, how bad a life that they had come from, until somebody told him, well, you should be you should be happy that you don't have to look up back on how bad you were. You know, we have all sinned, but uh, Dobson was the son of a, a Baptist or a Nazarene minister, by the way. But he, knowing that, said that he could understand. You know, that even though he didn't have his, his much wickedness in his background as, as a lot of other people. He was, it was just as much of a miracle that he was saved as, as others. Part of salvation, if you go by the, the doctrine of the <coughs> Methodist churches, is we are saved and initially sanctified when we are saved. But later on, there's a crisis point in our life where we totally become totally obedient to the Lord, that we are entirely sanctified. And I believe that totally, because I've experienced that. I think he's going to pass uh, I was saved as a, as a child at a um, free Methodist church. Children's revival meeting, um, and it was, it was awesome. I remember my sister was there too. And the uh, my parents didn't go to church, but the neighbor people took us. They traveled probably 30 miles to get us to, to, with their child uh, to church, and it was really neat. And it's important that if uh, your neighbors don't go to church and they have children, uh, you can take those children. Anyway, I felt God's hand on my life um, as a child, and I, I didn't live.
live a life of alcoholism or stealing or any of that kind of stuff like Walt was saying, you know, it's, I don't have a, a wild story to tell of my conversion. But it wasn't until uh, 19, January 1972 that I was facing a crisis in my marriage. And I was dealing with somebody who was an alcoholic, a drug addict, a pedophile, wife beater, child beater, you know. And I trusted in my oath uh, when I was married that I, I believed in that promise. So I was trying to hang on to that promise. For better, for and uh, so I turned, I surrendered totally to God, just like the song says, I surrender all. And I wanted God's will for my life to get me through these things to help me. And he did. And uh, that, that's been 51 years ago. And uh, uh, I have never lost the desire to have God's will in my life. However, there have doesn't mean I have made mistakes or judgment, uh, sin, you know, during that 51 years. But God has been there uh, and listened to my repentant soul and forgave me for the things that I did. And those times that I, I had problems, made those mistakes, erred, uh, it was because I was not spending daily time in the Word, and I wasn't consulting God uh, advice in certain circumstances. So the um, desire for my heart is to be totally surrendered to Him in all that I do and say. So anyway, I thank you. I want to read this to you. This is Bonhoeffer's testimony. This is... Uh, it's from the book, uh, Cost of Discipline. If you want to read something, good. That's it. This is on the final pages of his book. He quotes Romans 8, 29. Whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And these are Bonhoeffer's words. Here is a promise with patches all which passes all understanding. Those who follow, follow Christ are destined to bear His image and to become the brethren of the firstborn Son of God. Their goal is to become as Christ. Christ's followers always have His image before their eyes, and in the light all other images are screened from their sight. It penetrates into the depths of their bearing, being, fills them and makes them more and more like the Master. The image of Jesus Christ impresses itself <coughs> in daily communion on the image of the disciple. No follower of Jesus can contemplate his image in a spirit of cold detachment. That image has the power to transform our lives. And if we surrender ourselves utterly to him, we cannot help bearing his image ourselves. We can become the sons of God. We stand side by side with Christ our unseen brother bearing the image of God. That's my prayer. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being patient with me. And bless you all. You. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for those witnesses that we read about in history. We, we thank you for these people here as well. Be with us now. And be with Bob as he brings the Sunday school message, we pray in Jesus' name.